This is Rafi Kaluzon, and you are tuned in to Nothing But That Sports Talk. Welcome to another episode of Nothing But That Sports Talk. I'm Rafi Kaluzon, and joining me on the show for the very first time is SNY insider Ian Begley. Welcome to the show. Rafi, how are you, man? I'm pretty good. I mean, I'm glad I finally got a chance to connect with you. I've been kind of following you ever since your appearances on Knicks Fan TV, SNY. And I'm glad that I finally get a chance to, to interview you after connecting with you at the NBA draft earlier this year. Yeah, I'm happy to be here, my friend. Yeah, but when we talk a little bit about like how your journalism career got started. Sure, yeah. Um, I studied journalism in college um, down at the University of Richmond, and I worked for the town paper there um, part time. So got some experience there and then. Uh, I got an internship at the New York Daily News coming out of college, and I did some freelance work for them, and then eventually got hired full-time to cover high school sports there, and I covered high school sports, I don't know, for four years or so, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, my boss at the Daily News went over to ESPN, and uh, he was kind enough to give me a shot over at ESPN New York, and started covering a little bit of everything over there, Giants, Jets, Yankees, Mets, Knicks, Nets, some hockey, and uh, eventually uh, slid into the Nick beat role, and I've been covering the Knicks, man, on my own for probably 10 years or so now. Wow, that's amazing, and this is a good, and obviously all that, all those, all those moments led to you get laying the job at SNY as an insider, like, how does that, how does everything from ESPN New York progress all the way to SNY? Yeah, so I, you know, I, I was really blessed to work with a lot of talented people at ESPN. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Adrian Wojnarowski, Zach Lowe, Brian Windhorst, Ramona Shelburne, the uh, list goes on and on, Mark Stein prior to that. And I learned a lot from those reporters, Mark Spears, and uh, just learned a ton and was able to grow there and, uh, you know, got married, had a family, started a family. And then um, SNY, uh, you know, the opportunity came along and I thought it was a good opportunity, great opportunity, I should say, because of uh, the platform, A, and also just work-life balance. Uh, they've been fantastic in terms of uh, allowing me to be a father, be a husband, and also be a reporter. And so, it's been really good, really, really good for me. That was uh, that was part of the draw coming over there, and uh, it's been fun. We've had a lot of fun. We've covered some good teams. We've covered some bad teams, and we'll see what happens this year. And I understand that throughout your time working at SNY, not only were you working with people that are working in those major companies, you also got a chance to connect with many different media professionals from uh, like from Knicks Fan TV. Yes, I'm like. Want to talk a little bit about how their contribution made a major impact to your coverage of the New York Knicks? You know what? Uh, you mentioned Rafiq, you mentioned uh, CP and the fellas at Knicks Fan TV. I have so much respect for those guys, the way that they have uh, grown, you know, starting a show from scratch, building an audience is just tremendous. I, you know, it's, it's fun to watch their rise, it's fun to watch CP's rise. Um, but that that doesn't answer your question. Can you say your question again? I'm sorry. Again, like how, like your, your coverage of your Knicks developed a lot from working with guys like like CP the franchise with Knicks Fan TV and, and a bunch of other main different Knicks content creators like like th like those that work for Nick of Time. Like, how does that help you become a better, not just a better Knicks reporter, but a New York sports reporter? Yeah, I think you always have to listen to the voice of the fan. And I think you always have to take into account the fan. And, and obviously, uh, different fans for the same team can have a, a wide range of opinions. But I think it's important to listen to the fan and to have the fan in your mind when you're working. What would a fan, diehard fan, want to know at this point in time about this team? What questions should I ask to shed some light, to maybe get some information? Uh, about a player, coach, or a team that a fan would have interest in or want to know the answer to. So I, th I think that's why I really enjoy, you know, not only going on the shows, but just interacting generally with um, 
KOT, with Knicks Fan TV, with so many um, Nick fans who have either have shows or are just on Twitter. I really enjoy the back and forth, the uh, uh, sharing of ideas, sharing opinions. If you want to crush me for whatever, it's fine. I, I enjoy that. I enjoy it all because to me, the fan is who you're working for. Yes, you're working for your company, um, but you're working for the fan out there because they are the ones who are seeking the information that you hope to provide. Exactly, and I've watched a couple, and I watched it like like five or six minutes, of, minutes or, or a little bit of the, your appearance on Knicks Fan TV with Alex Trycast, who who actually was on my show earlier this year during the Knicks playoff run and CP the franchise. Like you guys gave some super great insights, talk about the Knicks from the players to watch, like like how they're going to build off of last year, or do you expect them to build off of last year? Like, and, and this and this will transition to my question, like. What are some of the pros and cons of the New York team, starting with the New York Knicks? Pros and cons in terms of, like, their strengths and weaknesses? Yes. Yeah, I would say you look at this Knicks team, and it's it's guard-heavy. I think if Julius Randle were to get hurt, I wonder which th- way they would go, how they would fill that gap, especially if he's hurt for a significant period of time. That would be uh, a difficult situation to have to handle for this team, just the way the roster is. And, you know, I think you also look at this team and you say there are some good shooters on this team, but are there is there enough shooting? And are these guys going to shoot to the way that they have shot the ball recently? There's always some variance in the three point shot. But are these guys going to be able to be threats from the perimeter? That to me is is so important for every team in the NBA. But the Knicks, particularly because you look at that playoff series against the Heat, they just couldn't knock shots down. Uh, outside of a select few performances. And so you have to have the shooting to be able to spread the floor. They were a great offense in the regular season. Um, things slowed down in the playoffs. And, and again, it comes down to making shots. So that's where I look at this team in terms of uh, the potential cons. Now, the pros, you have continuity with this roster. And I think that matters. You don't get that a lot uh, in the NBA to this degree with the Knicks basically bringing everybody back from last season. Minus Obi Toppin, who was dealt to Indiana, and they added Dante DiVincenzo. So you've got the same head coach, same team president, a lot of the same players. There is continuity here, something that the Knicks had struggled to find for so long. Will that translate to success on the court? We'll see, but I do think that that's a positive. And then you know, you're bringing back some talented players, the bulk of your scoring from last season when you look at particularly Jalen Brunson, Julius Randle, and you have young guys who can make another step here in Emmanuel Quickly, Mitchell Robinson, Quentin Grimes, even R.J. Barrett. Uh, so there are re- a lot of pros to me with this team right now as they prepare for the upcoming regular season. Exactly. And what we've seen from the old Knicks all last season, even in games which, which they knew they were kind of going to not going to win, they showed a lot of perseverance. I mean, whenever Julius Reynolds have an off night, you have Jalen Brunson going off for of forty-one points, points, and, and that's the type, of, and that's the type of leadership that the New York Knicks were lacking the season before. Prior to return to the playoffs last year and get to the next round, they, the part of the reason why they got as far as they did, they had leadership with Jalen Brunson. When he's not giving you about forty points, he's he's taking it inside. He, he's 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 literally being the floor general, making sure that other players get involved on in the offensive end. Not to mention the chemistry that you've had from since Villanova days. When, you, when they added Josh Hart middle of the season and they added Dante DiMincenzo, so that Villanova reunion, do you think will make a big impact on the Knicks this season? Yeah, I mean, if if things go well for the Knicks, that Villanova uh, trio adding Ryan Archie Bacchino, uh, foursome, I think, you know, if things go well for New York, it's going to be because Josh Hart has made a major contribution. It's going to be going to be because Dante DiVincenzo has made a major contribution. And then Jalen Brunson, you know, I don't know how you build off last year because, excuse me, it's me. Uh, he was brilliant in his first year in New York. But um, do, can you come back and repeat that? Can you increase your production somehow, some way? I think if the Knicks are going to be successful this year, it's going to be because those Villanova guys are playing really well, contributing to winning. So that a lot hinges on those three in my mind. Obviously. 
there's more players on the roster. There's there's plenty of other things that would need to go right for the Knicks to win. But when you talk about that Villanova core, yeah, you need them to play well for this season to be a success, I think. Yeah, that's exactly a great, interesting point. And we're, while we're talking, while to piggyback what you said about the success, the Knicks were about two victories away from reaching the conference finals. Do you think that with Julius Randle and RJ Barrett, and have, having their best season or, or or even something close to their best season can carry the New York Knicks to a conference finals appearance. It's tough, I think, because you look just on paper, right, at Milwaukee and at Boston. Boston coming back, bringing mostly everybody back and adding a Drew Holiday, and then obviously Milwaukee adding a Damian Lillard. And just on paper, those two teams seem to be a tier above everybody else in the East. So when you talk about getting to the conference finals, if you're the Knicks, you're talking about getting through one of those teams in the second round. That's tough. Um, obviously health plays a huge role every year in every pro sport. Um, so health would be an issue for Boston and Milwaukee, uh, but just on paper right now, it's, it's hard to see how any other team in the East would get through one of those two to crash the conference finals party. And that's an interesting point because we just saw that the Milwaukee Bucks added Damian Lillard and the Boston Celtics added Drew Holiday in, in, in that trade that happened. I mean, like the, the, those two teams are favorites to get out of the Eastern Conference. And do you think the York Knicks have, have what it takes to compete with any one of those teams? Yeah, I think they could compete, right? I think, but competing, being competitive, I think they could be competitive with any team in the league on any given night. Just over a course of a seven-game series is, is where it gets tricky. Now, I'll say it again, injuries always play a factor in a team's success, particularly when a team is is going as far as, you know, the conference championship series or the NBA finals. They have to get lucky with from a health perspective. But if those two teams are healthy, just over a seven-game series, I, I just struggle to see how New York would get through. Um those guys, either of those teams, but you know, I also didn't see them winning 47 games last year. I didn't have them winning a first round playoff series last year. So they clearly uh, beat my expectations in a big way last year. And maybe they would do that again this year. Well, hopefully everything falls in fruition after everything we just described when it comes to those players with the Knicks. But to wrap up the Knicks conversation, I mean, name your player to watch this season in the New York Knicks. I'm going to say Quentin Grimes, and I'm going to say Quentin Grimes because he's such a linchpin on that starting unit. And I think you can, you could see more from Grimes if he had the ball in his hands, if he had the opportunity to do some more things to get in rhythm on the offensive end. So if you see that, if you see a little bit of an expanded role from Grimes and he continues to defend on the perimeter, you know, I think that Knicks will be a very, very strong team. And if he, you know, is kind of put in the corner on offense and, and doesn't get those opportunities and he's out of rhythm when he gets those shots, I think it's it's a different story for this Nick team. So I think Grimes, to me, if he can maintain or exceed the level that he played at defensively last year, and if he can get a few more shot attempts on offense, take advantage of that this year, he's a player to watch uh, as I go into this season. That's a very interesting point. I mean, we've had showed a lot of a lot of improvement from Quentin Grimes. I mean, I've seen a lot of improvement from Quentin Grimes in the past few seasons, where compared to when he was just like like just starting to play like a month into the two thousand twenty one twenty two season, where he was just starting to get into the rhythm, the coaching system that Tom Thibodeau was was trying to accumulate him into, and then also last year he's proven to be a major factor on the offensive end. He knows how to play good perimeter defense, so. That's pretty good and interesting insights on Quentin Grimes. But if you ask me, one player that we don't talk about is Mitchell Robinson. He's mm. a lot of yes. even, even when he's not really scoring much with the two end dunks, he's showing a lot of aggressiveness on the inside by getting going after the rebounds, rebounds making sure that that other play is like 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 behind the sign gets some points too. He's a, he's a very versatile player on the inside and the low post. Right, absolutely. I mean, listen. You talk about uh, a guy who, what he does, his impact does not necessarily show up in the box score. That's Mitchell Robinson. And you talk to Tom Thibodeau, you talk to some of his teammates. And Quinn Grimes went as far as to say he's the most important player on our team. And what he does for them, right, he, he's not going to score. He's not going to shoot from the perimeter. But he's going to be a pick-and-roll lob threat, which 
forces defenses to pay attention to him as he's rolling off the screen. He sets good screens defensively. He gets off of screens well, defends the pick and roll really well, defends around the rim, and finishes around the rim on offense. And look, he's he's not going to be uh, like a Carl Towns where you're, he's shooting threes. It's just not going to happen, at least right now, for Mitchell Robinson. But what he does do night in and night out, he is a lead at, and it's very important to this Nick team. So, Rafik, I agree with you. Mitchell Robinson is right there on the list of uh, important players going into this season for New York. Yep, he's my sleeper for 2024. Now, on to the Brooklyn Nets. As you saw, for, for the second consecutive year, year they made the playoffs and got swept. They haven't missed the playoffs since 2018, and, uh, and they only managed to tally one first-round round series win during the Kevin Durant era before we, before we got traded to the Phoenix Suns and Kyrie Irving got traded to the Dallas Mavericks. I mean, obviously, obviously the Mavericks didn't miss the playoffs while Kevin Durant lost in the second round to the Denver Nuggets while playing for the Phoenix Suns. But sticking with the Brooklyn Nets, you, you finally get a healthy Ben Simmons that we had not gotten all of last year and in, in the second half of the year before. So what is your outlook for the Brooklyn Nets? And can Ben Simmons carry the Brooklyn Nets back into the postseason and being the player that he was before the trade request that he had in 2021? I think they should make the playoffs, right? As far as Simmons goes, if he's healthy, um, he's shown in the preseason that he's going to impact the game in a positive way. As far as getting back to the Simmons of 2021, 2020, uh, I'm not sure. You know, I, I don't know if he can get all the way there, but it seems like physically he's figured some things out and he looks great on the court. Uh, and so if he can continue to be healthy, continue to play at a high level, I do think this net team should make the playoffs because you look at their roster, it's pretty strong. Mikhail Bridges, Cam Johnson, Nick Claxton, Spencer Dinwiddie, and then the the even the reserves are strong too. I mean, Dorian Finney-Smith, Royce O'Neal, uh, Dennis Smith Jr. in the rotation. If he's in the rotation, he's a strong point of attack defender. And then you know, obviously, you have uh, the young guy uh, from LSU, Cam Thomas, that is fantastic, fantastic talent. So I think they have a lot of depth. Um, I think they can, they should be able to defend really well based on their personnel. So I think that'll win them a lot of games. And yeah, they should be back in the playoffs. Yeah, exactly. Especially when when you got back Spencer Dibberty in the, the Kyrie Irving trade. The Spencer Dibberty, like like before the Kevin Durant Kyrie Irving era, he showed to be a clutch player at times. And then you have Markel Bridges, who did have a final appearance with the Phoenix Suns when he came to the Brooklyn Nets. He, he, he got you the way he's been able to knock down the three point shots and then decide to then knock it down the perimeter shots and take it to the hole. He showed that he could be like the, the, the future piece for the Brooklyn Nets that they need while, as being a starter compared to when he was just a role player during his days of the Phoenix Suns. And Cam Johnson, he has that jump shot. He just needs to get more involved in the offensive end and start and, and become more intelligent when it comes to his shot selection. Yeah, these are young players, right? And if they can continue to grow under Jacques Vaughn and the net organization, this it seems like a solid core. But I think also you look at both these teams, right? The Nets and the Knicks. Given the Nets, <clears throat> excuse me, draft assets, given the Knicks draft assets and where they are in the team building phase, I think both groups want to win, want to be successful right away. I think they're both pretty well positioned to swing a big trade. So even when we're talking about all these young players, you know, I think in some ways you look at these guys and you wonder how do other teams value them? Because I think both the Knicks and the Nets, if the opportunity presented itself would be aggressive in trying to trade for a top player that they thought was going to take them to the next level. So yeah, a lot of young talent on both sides of the East river but also keep an eye on the trade market and how aggressive the Knicks or Nets will be once we get to trade season in the NBA. And since we're on the subject of talking about the trade season, if the, if the Brooklyn Nets or, it, 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 well, if those New York teams were to make a trade, which, which players do you think they should go after, starting with the Brooklyn Nets and then the New York Knicks? It's hard to say because so much of what happens during that trade deadline is, is based on what happens in the first you know few months of the season if a team is underperforming and they want to make a big trade dump off uh, a top player to try to get you know a better draft position then you're talking about uh, being in a good situation if you're trying to add talent so 
you know, hypothetically, if Toronto doesn't play that well, if they struggle, maybe they revisit the idea of moving Pascal Siakam or an OG and an OB. Um, I think both players would, you know, I think the Knicks and the Nets would be interested in both of those players if they became available. Uh, you don't really often see an in-season trade of a star, star player. It's, it's pretty rare. Usually those deals happen in the off season. So those two guys in particular, keeping an eye on that situation in Toronto. And uh, it really just depends on where teams shake out of a team like Chicago with expectation struggles. Maybe DeMar DeRozan becomes available. Uh, there's just so many different ways things can go as we sit here, you know, a few days away from the start of the regular season. When you're talking about trades, yeah, you look for a team that's underperforming and see if they want to get off of assets or if they're will they want to take on uh, some talent and then maybe you can make something happen there. That's a pretty interesting point. And I just found out on the news earlier, just not in recent days, that the Knicks are going to be monitoring the call it the town situation as far as like, I mean, We'll, we'll, and, and how what what they gonna what assets are gonna get to get Kyrie Towns and if he's gonna continue building off of those playoff appearances he had with the Minnesota Timberwolves. So, any thoughts on the possibility of Knicks getting Kyrie Towns? Yeah, my thought there is is I kind of been saying it for a few weeks now since the off season was I think if the Knicks wanted Carl Anthony Towns enough in the off season, they could have traded for him. They I think the opportunity was there. And so if they now pursue Towns now or prior to the trade deadline, that would be a shift in organizational thinking on Towns because, again, I think if they wanted to get him out of, from Minnesota in the offseason, they could have done it. Um, so, you know, we'll see what happens there. Obviously, we're talking about a trade of a player uh, of that stature, that salary, you have the salary match. So you're talking about, you know, Evan Fournier and then R.J. Barrett. Julius Randle to try to match the salary of a Carl Towns and probably add, they need to add a few more players. Um, so there are different ways than they can make the money work. But I think first and foremost, they have to decide is Carl Towns our big swing? Is he the player that's going to get us to the next level? If they think he is, then they should go get him and see where the chips fall. Yes, that's a very interesting point. And to continue the trade conversation, Earlier today, we just we just found out that Victor Oladipo is going to the Houston Rockets in a trade for Kevin Porter Jr. He will get cut for the Oklahoma City Thunder, so so Thunder fans don't get too excited. But I just want to ask you this: I mean, like when you knew about that trade, what are your overall thoughts? And which team do you think will benefit more from the Victor Oladipo Kevin Porter Jr. trade? Yeah, this trade, uh, I have thought non basketball thoughts on it because Kevin Porter obviously got into some trouble, domestic violence uh, incident allegedly in New York in the off season. And the details there that were reported at least allegedly were, were horrific stomach turning. And so now Houston wants to trade him because they know that they are not, they not going to play him. And I was surprised that a team decided to, to take Kevin Porter Jr. on, even though he's getting waived immediately. OKC did it so they can get some draft assets back. And so I guess they got a few what, second round picks. Um, is it worth it though? To, to What message are you sending to your fan base when you make that kind of trade? For purely from a basketball perspective, uh, I think you look at Victor Oladipo, if he's healthy, um, he can help you. And that's a big if for Victor um, after his knee issues, but I have faith in Old Depot. If he's healthy, he can help you on the floor. And uh, that's a young Houston team that could use a, a few more rotation players. So we'll see what happens with Old Depot there. Yeah, that's exactly right. And let's not forget, they did pick up Fred Van Vliet during the offseason to talk about the Houston Rockets. If, if, if healthy, that could be a big step to, for the Houston Rockets towards getting back to being the playoff team that we saw during the James Harden days. Yeah, and I think they need to start winning. I think just based on what I was hearing over the summer, like uh, it's it's winning time over there. There's not a lot of interest in tanking for another 19-year-old uh, draft pick. I think that they showed you over the summer with their moves, with Van Vliet uh, 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 being very aggressive on Lopez. Uh, they're ready to win. So uh, we'll see what happens when they throw the balls out. But 
and Fred Van Vliet, they brought in a very, very talented uh, lead guard, a veteran guy who knows how to win. So if you're trying to set a winning tone, build a winning culture, uh, they, they went a long way towards getting that by signing Van Vliet. And that's a big step in the right direction for the Houston Rockets as they continue to grow that franchise to get it back to the championship contention team that, contending team that we saw in the, the 2010s. And speaking of championship contention, as as I, I don't know if you, I mean, obviously you're busy with your Brooklyn Nets and New York Knicks coverage, first of all, you probably be aware that the New York Liberty are in, you're in the middle of, of, the, of trying to bring home a championship with something that the New York Knicks or the Brooklyn Nets have not even had a chance to do in this century. Right. They're in the championship. They're, they're two wins away from win from clinching the first championship by a New York professional basketball team since the 1973 New York Knicks. And, and Chelsea Gray is out with a, is out of the gate four with an injury, along with Keir Stokes. And, and I'm it's just it's, it's just to keep things updated and I'll get more to that episode. But I just want to ask you your opinion on what would a Liberty Championship do for the culture of New York basketball. If I think it would be fantastic. I mean, I think. Uh, first and foremost, just <laughs> these fans, basketball fans in this city have been starving for a championship for a long time. You referenced it the last one, 72-73. Uh, even the team making the finals, you have to go back to Jason Kidd's Nets teams, and they were in New Jersey. So the New York team making the finals, you're going back to 1999. And so it's been a while since the New York basketball team has gotten to this point. You know, if they win it, it'd be fantastic to see uh, a parade in New York for this Liberty team that has a ton of talent. They do have an avenue here because of the injury to come back from uh, the, the O2 deficit. It'd be tough to do so, but there's a there's a pathway there. So it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. But yeah, I think just for New York, uh, a championship in the WNBA uh, would certainly be something to uh, celebrate and be excited about. Exactly. And one last question before I let you go. I mean, this whole entire season with the New York Liberty and, and the type of loss that they've had, what is this super team doing different that the Brooklyn Nets super teams with Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, James Harden were not doing in terms of reaching championship success? Man, I think just being on the floor, being healthy, uh, playing, uh, being available for games, because I think you, you take all the noise away, outside noise away from that net situation and comes down to Harden, Durant, and Irving just not playing a lot of games together. And you saw when they were on the court, that playoff series against the Celtics, they were dominant. I mean, they looked phenomenal. And, you know, players have even said, like, if Kyrie Irving didn't get hurt against the Bucs, the Nets were going to win the title. And I I, I saw it the same way. So the team was very good when those guys were healthy uh, and, and were on the court together. Uh, but just did, just did not happen often enough. And with this Liberty team, they've dealt with injuries just like every other team in the WNBA. But, you know, by and large, they've had their top players perform. And I think that's one of the differences that you see here between the Nets and the Liberty. That's very interesting. I can't wait to see this come to fruition. Thank you for taking your time to stop by, by Ian Begley. I, I can't wait to see more of the work you do for SNY and and, and not not just on television, but in the streaming platforms, you can you can continue following this work work covering the New York Knicks and the Brooklyn Nets and a few appearances on Knicks Fan TV. I really appreciate your time, I, Ian Begley. Hey Rafiq, uh, it was a pleasure to be here, man. I'm I'm glad we did it. It was fun talking to you. And uh, for Ian Begley, Rafiq Luzon, we'll see you next time.